So the usual volume of um, the pleural fluid that's present is about 0.1 cc's per kilogram. Uh, cells that are there are predominantly, uh, have WBCs about 1,700 cells, RBCs about 700 cells. 75% of them are macrophages, 25% are lymphocytes. Uh, the mean oncotic pressure is uh, about five centimeters of water, which is based on hey, a uh, protein level, usually of about one to 1.5 grams per deciliter. Pleural bicarb is about 20 to 25% higher than serum bicarb. Sodium is about three to 5% lower. Chloride is six to 9% lower than serum. Uh, potassium and glucose are similar. And so obviously if you have somebody who is uh, hyperglycemic, then their glucose is going to be higher, even if it's a paranormonic effusion. So it's something to keep in mind. Pleural PCO2 is similar uh, as the uh, PCO2. So if somebody sends like a full blood gas or you know everything in the, uh, instead of just the pH on that ABG syringe, you should find the pleural PCO2 is about the same. Blood supply, uh, the parietal pleura is supplied by the intercostal, the pericardiophrenic, uh, superior phrenic, and the musculophrenic. Uh, uh, arteries, the intercostal veins, uh, they drain either into the IVC or the brachiocephalic, and then there are inferior and superior phrenic veins. Visceral pleura is supplied by bronchial artery and pulmonary arteries. It's got a dual supply, and pulmonary veins are for the venous drainage. Nerve supply, uh, intercostal nerves, they supply the costal pleura and the peripheral diaphragmatic pleura. The central portion of the diaphragm is supplied by the phrenic nerve. Physiology, so the rate of pleural fluid formation is about 0.01 to 0.02 cc's per kilogram per hour. Uh, it's mainly cleared through lymphatics, which is about 0.2 to 0.4 cc's per kilogram per hour, and that's why you don't have a lot of fluid that is left in there. Uh, parietal pleural capillaries are the origin of the pleural fluid usually, but in disease states, the origin of the pleural fluid is from the interstitial spaces of the lung. So um, if you see the pleural fluid dynamics, um, the, this is the hydrostatic pressure. So the hydrostatic pressure within the, it, within the pleural space is about minus 5. So um, there is a net gradient of plus 29 from the visceral pleura and about plus 35 from the parietal pleura. And then the onconic pressure is plus five, so then there is a net um, movement outwards um, uh, because the onconic pressure within the, in the parietal pleural capillaries and the visceral pleural capillaries is about plus 34. So overall, there is a net movement inward of about six centimeter of water pressure, and that's what is responsible for the collection of the pleural fluid. Okay, so this is, um, you know, this physiology is important to know in order to uh, determine why you have a pleural effusion. So you can have a pleural effusion due to increased pleural fluid formation, and so that can be either due to an increase in the interstitial lung fluid caused such as by left ventricular failure, pneumonia, or a PE. It can be due to increased intravascular pressure as seen by due to right ventricular failure, left ventricular failure, or the superior vena cava syndrome. And we don't normally see this as to increase pleural fluid protein, but in case of paraproteinemia, as you wonder whether that might be uh, a source at times. Decreased pleural pressure caused by either atelectasis or increased uh, elastic recoil of the lung. So this is in cases of trapped lung or entrapped lung and that is the reason for why they sometimes may be um, pleural fluid formation as a result. Um, they can also be increased peritoneal fluid, so if in patients who have the uh, defect in the diaphragm, that results in just like the hepatic hydrothorax patients, so you may sometimes see this in patients who have, who are on peritoneal dialysis where they start getting a pleural effusion. And then if there is a disruption of either the thoracic duct, which would be the cause for a chylothorax, or if, you know, in following trauma, if there is uh, blood vessels that uh, bleed into the pleural space, that's going to give rise to increased pleural fluid formation. Um, the other reason for the effusion can be with decreased pleural fluid absorption. Like I said, lymphatics are mainly responsible for the reabsorption of the fluid. 
and this can be a decrease as a result of lymphatic obstruction. Um, it's also because of elevation of the systemic vascular pressure because you know the lymphatics eventually drain into the venous system through the thoracic duct. So if you have increased systemic vascular pressures, such as with right ventricular failure or SVC syndrome, that can give rise to um, uh, you know, pleural fluid formation. So this is the mechanism whereby with just right ventricular failure, where normally we say, oh, you can get a pleural effusion, you can, and this would be the mechanism why you would get that pleural effusion. So in terms of uh, chest X-ray appearance, you need uh, about 175 to 500 cc's to obliterate the costophrenic angle in a supine patient, whereas about 50 to 75 cc's the patient is standing up. Uh, Subpulmonic effusions can be present. This is uh, evidenced by elevation of either one or both diaphragm. So on the PA film, you will see that the apex of the diaphragm is a little bit more lateral, uh, and then the apparent diaphragm tends to slope more sharply towards the costophrenic angle. So uh, as is shown here, uh, it's not that clear, but... Um, can see that the apex is somewhere here as opposed to being somewhere mid diaphragm and then the slope is more sharply going downwards and that is suggest suggestive of uh, fluid collection in PA. In this case it is because the patient is standing up you can see there is a big uh, separation between the diaphragm and the gastric bubble and if this is more than two centimeters um, then it suggests that there is a subpulmonic effusion. So these are other subtle changes um, that might be seen. Vascular structures in supine film. So this is your ICU patient. So you have that the vascular structures can be easily identified under the density. So you'll see this why, you know, like a, um, a density that's present, but the underlying structures can still be visualized. And the other thing is it's mostly homogenous. So it doesn't restrict itself in a low bar distribution, which is what you would expect if you think this is some kind of ground glass opacity uh, taking place uh, as a result of, let's say, pulmonary edema or pneumonia. Um, and then there'll be no air bronchograms present either. Why is it, uh, is that the reset button is still there? Because it looks very nicely here, but um, what you are seeing. Oh, you mean on the projector? Yeah, you can lighten it up. So the center. Never no, mind. That's okay. It's just one or two, a couple of them. That's fine. Second is a contrast, right? So that's more. So we need to decrease the contrast. <laughs> I can't see anything. <laughs> Any problem with the other slides, we can go back to factory reset or something, right? All right. So, um, but you guys are all familiar with the films I'm talking about, right? So in the ICU, you will see that either there is a separation between the um, uh, end of, you know, this is the chest wall, kind of, if you imagine, somewhere there, and the uh, this thing is, you know, is pointing towards that. We won't dwell on it. So symptoms, um, you can have a pleuritic chest pain. So the location can be um, anywhere uh, on the chest, upper abdomen, and even the shoulder. So this is sometimes if you, uh, at the end of a thoracentesis, sometimes you'll find that the patients will say that, oh, you know, the pain is in the, actually the upper part of the, um, or the lower part of the rib cage, upper part of the abdomen that they are feeling it, or sometimes in the shoulder because of the irritation of the diaphragmatic portion, which then, ref uh, that's referred pain. They can be a dull ache that they can complain of, uh, and they're often seen with malignancy. And then um, they could be coughing, caused either by inflammation of the pleura or because of the apposition of the bronchial walls. Now this can sometimes be seen in patients who complain that they start coughing as soon as they lie down. 
and that's because of the fact that there's more atelectasis or acquisition of the bronchial walls that occurs as they change position. Um, dyspnea can be present as a result of eventration of the diaphragm, so it removes, causes the diaphragm to function at a mechanical disadvantage, and so that causes the shortness of breath. Um, it can decrease ventricular filling mm -hmm. as a result of which patients can uh, feel short of breath, and then if there is associated pharyngeal disease, um, that may be the other cause for the shortness of breath. So if there is increased blue load pressure, so we had, um, I didn't bring that in anyway, we wouldn't have seen it. But sometimes you can say patients may complain of more shortness of breath as a result of a mediastinal shift. So they're coming in with their, uh, uh, there is increased pleural pressure and the hemithorax appears larger. On the chest x-ray or intercostal spaces, concavity is missing or it's convex. And in the opposite side, if you have decreased pleural pressure, such as in a patient who has a trapped lung and an effusion, there might be a smaller hemithorax and more concavity uh, in the intercostal spaces. On exam, uh, again, there will be decreased tactile tremitus, there will be dullness on percussion, and decreased breath sounds. So, uh, what is uh, LIFE's criteria, Sala, in terms of... Um, It is then called a, if it's more than 0.5, then it's a, it's an exudate, okay? Okay. And how many need to be present to call it an exudate? So we have to have one of them. Just one. one so as long as you have one of them gets also, so that's important to remember that, you know, you don't have to have two out of three or, you know, all of them present. It just needs to be one. So you could have an exudate either on protein or by uh, LDH criteria. So sometimes that becomes a problem um, in patients who have congestive heart failure who are on high-dose diuretics. So in those cases, uh, if you're... If you think clinically that the patient effusion is related to congestive heart failure, but your serum uh, to fluid protein ratio is more than 0.5, in that case, then you can try this uh, serum to fluid protein gradient. And if it's greater than 3.1, then it's a transudate. It's similar to the albumin gradient that we use for peritoneal fluid. But since we don't routinely sense, uh, you know, fluid albumin for pleural effusions, then it becomes a problem. So they have shown that similarly the gradient of more than 3.1 can suffice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's similar to that. Is it greater or it's smaller than 3.1? For, it needs to be greater. Yeah, the way I'm, you know, sorry, I'm trying to understand this a little bit better. So serum to fluid to protein gradient. So, mm -hmm. so from serum to protein, it's fluid, yeah. right? Serum so let's to say fluid. fluid is 1 and serum is 4. Mm -hmm. So less is better, though. No, no. So if, let's say, if the fluid protein is high, that means the gradient will be less, right? So that means right. it's an exudate. So oh, okay. Transudate. Right? So if it's a trans for a transudative effusion, uh -huh. the difference will be protein. because there's less protein coming out into the fluid. Okay. But that makes sense. I was thinking about the protein. Yeah, so not an exudate. Okay. So it's transudate. The other test that can be sent, uh, and sometimes labs have a problem because they are not... Um, you know, standardized to do that, or it's not, uh, doesn't meet criteria for fluid fluid. But if you have, if you send it and they do it, then if it's greater than 2,000, then it's likely to be a transudate. Appearance of the fluid, so, um, you know, you can classify them as uh, bloody. So for bloody effusion to be present, you all, all you need is about 5,000 to 10,000 RBCs per uh, cc. Uh, and so it can be, um, if, you t if it's grossly bloody, then you need to get a hematocrit. And sometimes you forget to send the hematocrit, and so in those cases, you could get a rough idea by dividing the RBC count by uh, 100,000. That's roughly your hematocrit. Okay. Uh, and then uh, in these cases, sometimes you'll also find that the macrophages have RBC, ingested RBCs that may be present in the fluid. So it's uh, a more than 1% is significant, and if it's more than 20% uh, 20 then they need to be, uh, they need drainage, but if more than 50% then it's a hemothorax. Right. So turbid um, can be uh, either uh, due to cells or proteins, spelling wrong, sorry, 
so what you do in these cases is to go and have the specimen centrifuge. So if the supernatant is clear, then that's because the turbidity was because of cells and protein. But if it remains turbid, then it's related to lipids. So when you saw that thylothorax, was that it remained turbid after cheap centrifuge? Yes. Right. Uh, and then it can be feculent um, or anchovy paste, which is the, uh, you know, you'll never see it. I've never seen it. Uh, but it's because of the rupture of the anemic liver abscess. So you will get this on boards, of course, because they like such questions. And then uh, it can have, it can be urine because of rupture of a, uh, you know, a renal cyst or a hydronephrotic kidney cyst. And in those cases, it will be a transudative effusion, but with an acidic pH. So that's very classic. And that's, again, uh, you know, questions that boards like because you don't often see them. But they make for good questions. All right. So WBC in a transudate, typically it's less than a thousand. We don't, you know, it really doesn't make any um, uh, correlate whether or not you have um, a transudate, transudate of effusion, uh, or how much the WBC count is in those cases. It makes more sense for an exudative effusion because if the cell count is more than 10,000, then it's likely to be a paranemonic effusion. And if the uh, WBCs that are present are predominantly neutrophilic, then your differential diagnosis is either secondary to infection or that is a paranemonic effusion. It can be related to PE, um, early tuberculosis. So initially, um, tubercular effusions can be neutrophilic and they become um, uh, lymphocytic later on. So it depends on at what stage you are trapping the effusion. And uh, malignant effusions, while most commonly are lymphocyte predominant, can be neutrophilic as well in some cases. Eosinophils, again, this is more for both questions, or but you also see it sometimes. Uh, the most likely reason for uh, seeing predominant eosinophilia is the presence of air or blood in the cooler space. Uh, other causes that can be there but are less commonly seen, uh, again, these are more for both questions, is if it is asbestos-related pleural effusion, if there is eosinophilic pneumonia, if it's a drug reaction, um, uh, parasitic diseases or Chirp-Strauss syndrome. So those would be some other reasons of why you would have more than 1% eosinophils in the cooler fluid. Lymphocyte predominant is variably defined as either greater than 50% or more than 80%. Your most common causes are tuberculosis, malignancy, and uh, post-coronary artery bypass, especially if you are tapping the effusion within the first post-op month. Uh, other causes are chylothorax, yellow nail syndrome, chronic rheumatoid effusions, sarcoidosis, uremia, and radiation. Mesothelial cells are uh, significant based on their absence or if it's less than 5%. So, Usman, which condition is it less than 5%? Um, absent or less than 5%. Absent or less than CB. So um, that's when it's helpful. So if you have a lymphocyte predominant effusion, which is exudative but has, you know, 10% mesothelial cells, then you can exclude tuberculosis as being one of the causes, with the exception that in some HIV patients, you may still have mesothelial cells. So it doesn't hold true for those patients. Uh, complicated paranormonic effusion is another condition where you might see this. And the reason they say this happens is because of there is an exudate that lines the pleural surfaces so that the, the normal shedding of cells does not take place. Malignant pleural effusions that uh, are present after pleurodesis may sometimes have absent mesothelial cells. Uh, sometimes mesothelial cells can be confused with uh, malignant cells. So um, you, you, some, you will see that atypical cells written in by the, um, when you're sending it for cell count, but often, you know, you will notice that when the cytology comes back as normal. Okay, and the other board question. So glucose in the pleural fluid um, is helpful by, as I said earlier, it's similar to the serum fluid glucose. A uh, serum glucose is the usual level of glucose in the pleural fluid. When it's less than 60, there are only a few conditions that give rise to that, and they are paranomonic effusion. Um, these, uh, it has, in these cases, it has a, uh, therapeutic implication because the lower the glucose, the less likely that this is going to resolve by itself and probably needs drainage. Uh, malignant effusion, it may be seen in about 15 to 20% of cases. 
Uh, rheumatoid disease, again, uh, can be extremely low. Sometimes it can be less than 10, and uh, as well as in tuberculosis. Other rare causes are the sparagonemiasis, hemothorax, jerk straws, and lupus. But you will get, you know, if you are going to get um, a question, then it's going to be either in, a, in the context of a paranormonic effusion or rheumatoid disease that you will see that. High glucose effusions, again, you shouldn't see a pleural fluid to serum glucose more than one. Like I said, <coughs> it's usually equal to one. So this can be a problem in when there is, let's say, somebody trying to put in a central line, if there is extra visation through there uh, and there is a line going in and it's bleeding into the pleural space, or there is uh, esophageal rupture and you know somebody's just had a soft drink uh, at the same time, or if there is uh, fitzperitoneal dialysis. So in those cases, you may have the PS to serum, pleural fluid to serum ratio of more than two. Again, um, these are more likely to come as both questions, clinically at an event, you might see one of these. Pleural fluid pH, uh, one thing to remember, when you send pH in the pleural fluid, it needs to be sent in an ABG syringe because that's the more accurate. It's not done with a, you know, with a dipstick. That's how, if you just send it in your regular urine container, just like urine samples, then all they're doing it is with that little um, paper stick that says this color is equal to this pH. If you really want to measure the hydrogen ion concentration like it's done in the ABG, you have to send it in an ABG syringe. Um, it's important that there is no air or air bubble in that because that can elevate the uh, pH. And this is a board question, by the way. It is in one of the seat questions. So if there is lidocaine in the syringe, that tends to, I think, increase the pleural fluid pH as well as if there is air in the syringe. So look out for them. I think if I remember correctly, there were a couple of questions that I did that had that. Um, and so, what are the other conditions that can be associated with very low pH? Um, most classically, it's with esophageal rupture. Um, so the pH can be as low as six. Uh, you can also see that in paranormonic effusions, in which case um, it's actually one of the indications for drainage is when you have a pH that's less than 7.2. Uh, collagen vascular diseases, sometimes with rheumatoid, you may see that, but lupus, usually it's more than 7.3. Malignant effusions can be there, and if it's low, then it's got a poor, again, a poor prognostic um, factor. But it's not useful to predict, as may be written in some texts, uh, to predict pleurodesis success, because oftentimes they'll say, oh, you know, the pH was less than 7.2, so it's not, pleurodesis is going to be a failure. So it is there in some texts, but typically we don't follow that if you're trying to do this. Tuberculosis, hemothorax, and the sparagonemiasis. Um, uh, is going to be, you know, somebody who comes from uh, Egypt or something, that's where, or South America, that's where this thing is getting. So. But you also have the inflammation in the mucosa that you Yeah, mm -hmm. that you have. So again, it's because of the increased utilization of glucose by either cells or bacteria in the pleural fluid space. You know, we don't send amylase, and please, I, I know you guys don't send it, but the residents often send an amylase in the pleural fluid. It's really not helpful. The only conditions where it might be helpful are in these four. So if you have uh, an effusion related to pancreatitis, whether it's acute or chronic, they may have an elevated amylase in them. With esophageal rupture, uh, again, there is increased amylase, and in those cases, it's you know helpful to see whether it's salivary or pancreatic. So that's the differentiation. But again, the clinical scenario is going to be different for both. Uh, malignancy, however, I mean, if it's an esophageal malignancy or a pancreatic malignancy, I don't know. So in those cases, um, it might be um, elevated. But not, uh, you know, they, it doesn't have any diagnostic or prognostic significance for malignant effusions, so you really do not have to send it. Uh, but if elevated, it's these malignancies are usually adenocarcinomas. All right, and the malignant effusion also, it's the salivary amylase, whereas in the pancreatitis, it's going to be pancreatitis. All right, LDH. LDH, again, is helpful for, obviously, when we are trying to uh, differentiate between an exudate and a transudate, but it really does not help differentiate between different types of exudated effusions.
So it doesn't help uh, differentiate between different types, uh, and it's usually elevated for malignant and paranormonic effusion. With paranormonic effusion, it's a prognostic uh, significance because sometimes I, uh, you know, I may not go into detail on that. But if you have a paranormonic effusion and you tap it once, and then you tap it again a couple of days later to see whether or not it's responding to antibiotics, if the LDH is going up, then that means it's not responding, and that's an indication for drainage. So. Um, it's in that context that it's helpful. Uh, if it's a, you know, a bloody effusion that doesn't necessarily increase the LDH in that, so the, uh, again, that's a misconception. LDH1 is elevated due to RBCs, and that's not the one that gets elevated in these cases. Cytology is helpful if it's, um, uh, you know, predominantly lymphocytic uh, fluid effusion in order to rule out malignancy. Uh, most likely uh, malignant effusions that their cytology is positive are adenocarcinomas, and 60% uh, positivity is noted with one specimen, 80% with three specimens. That's why we say that even if you have your first specimen was negative, you can tap it again uh, and then send it um, as is. Uh, for most cytologies, depends upon the skill of the cytologist. And then they should look at both the cell block and the smear. Um, because sometimes, you know, they can concentrate all the cells and take a look at it in the cell block. And again, it depends on how well they prepared the cell block. Other uh, tests that we order, one is the adenosine D aminase that is sent out for tubercular effusions, levels of more than 45 uh, as considered the threshold. But uh, again, it depends, varies from lab to lab. Um, in studies that have been done, levels of more than 70 are very specific for to can be seen in tubercular pruritus. It's not very specific because there are other conditions that can be associated with high levels of ADA as well, such as rheumatoid arthritis, empyema, neoplasm, and Q fever. Q fever will come as one of the sequels. <laughs> uh, pleural fluid lymphocytes to neutrophil ratio, if it's more than 0.75, that increases the test specificity for TB. Rheumatoid factor can be, is elevated in rheumatoid effusions, and we talked about BNP being elevated in um, patients who have um, transudative effusions due to heart failure. Now, pleural manometry, for those of you who didn't see it, there's a very good uh, pro-con in uh, chest that came out, I think, a couple months ago, if I'm not wrong, either May or June. Uh, so it's a nice, uh, some people, uh, you know, it is helpful when we are suspecting a trapped lung uh, in which case there is a precipitous decrease in or fall in pleural pressure with the amount of fluid that's removed, and this does come as a both question. So after 500 cc's, if there is a drop greater than minus 10 uh, or greater than 10 centimeters of water pressure, then that is uh, can suggest presence of a trapped lung. Entrapped lung or, well, so a normal uh, pleural space, the drop in pressure is not, is roughly about 10 centimeters. That's the most that we have seen. I, I had, we had, uh, we will be getting these in the lab, so we will be able to measure the pleural fluid pressure just for, um, 
you know, for the sake of doing it for some, it's, it probably as we do more of them, we will know which ones to probably try, which ones not to. Um, but the ones that uh, I tried, you know, the pressures, initial opening pressure was like, you know, maybe plus five, plus seven. So those were large effusions where, um, you know, and one of them was actually where there was immediate sinus shift, right? The pilothorax guy had, you know, up to like plus 10, and he didn't really go down below zero before we had to stop. But the others, you know, it started out as being plus seven, and then towards the end, as we reached the end, um, at the same time as the patient was getting symptomatic, you know, it did go down to uh, about minus two, minus three. But uh, with the entrapped lung. So entrapped lung is where the entrapment, this is where it's getting organized. So this is like your paranormonic effusion where it is, you know, the fibrous field is forming. So initially as you take out some amount up to 1,000 cc's, the drop in pressure is a little bit more than normal. But then after that 1,000 cc's, then there is a precipitous fall. That again indicates that this lung is about to get entrapped, maybe needs to have some kind of decortication done. Trap lung, like I said, is the other one where if you didn't to remove more fluid, that, you know, the lung will not expand, and so there will be um, a hydropneumothorax caused by the fact that there was a bubble. Mm -mm. No, this is entirely, it's made by an entirely different company. So the problem is that it's about $35 per uh, piece, and that's a cost that somehow will be included in the facility cost. So remember, the facility cost pays for the cost of however many un sets that you use. So essentially, whatever the, you know, 500, 400, if the each set costs about $100. If you use three, uh, then that means, you know, that cost is being eaten up by the hospital or for that particular procedure. But this $35 is not a separate cost that we can add to that goes in the facility cost. That's no, so it's a, it's a little, um, it's almost like a stopwatch um, like this, and so it's got a, a port on both ends. So the, um, the end that is through which you're draining the fluid, so there you first connect the manometer, and then uh, the other, the tubing then gets connected to the regular tubing that goes to the syringe. So as you apply negative pressure, you can actually measure how much negative pressure you are doing, so you don't really want to have really high negative pressure either, because that sometimes can cause, and there is a, a nice article that came out, um, I don't know, last year, where they said that even sometimes ultrasound guided thoracentesis, why they get a pneumothorax, even though you're doing it, is because of this high negative uh, pleural pressure that you apply. So that can cause a shear effect as the lung is re expanding, and that can cause a tear in the pleura, causing, and, you know, and the, and, uh, and the bronchioles that can cause a pneumothorax. So Steve San from uh, University of South Carolina had a paper that where they've seen, uh, and they do only ultrasound guided thoracentesis, but still patients get a pneumothorax. So just remember that it, um, even if you sometimes, like I, I sometimes do, and it's, I don't know if you, I sometimes will use the um, vacuum bottles just like you do with the peritoneal fluid. Now we don't have a regulator, like an IV fluid regulator to kind of uh, decrease or the negative pressure. So in those cases, just pinch and decrease the pressure, and then you can read how much negative pressure is there. So in that, in that way, it is helpful. And what we've seen is that, you know, in that how you pull, you can actually generate minus 300 uh, negative pressure just by how much you suck out. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, so um, I, I don't know if I have a slide on that. So the guidelines for how much fluid should be removed at one time, uh, both the British and the old American Thoracic Society guidelines was not more than 1.5 liters. There was one study where they had removed up to three to four liters per each session, and they had only four cases of uh, re-expansion pulmonary edema. And, um, and only one of them required, you know, uh, more, you know, required admission and, you know, had to be on oxygen and so on. So the point is that uh, in order to, you know, that's why we are saying the pro uh, argument for the pleural manometry was that this may help us to take out more fluid because as long as we are not going less than minus 10, you know, we can keep taking our fluid if the patient does not get symptomatic. But most of the times, what in a, at least the three times that we use the pleural manometer, patients got symptomatic around the same time as the pressure was falling. So we had to stop. Not related to the Just the chest pain and cough. So all, 
always, you know, and it's very close. And what, what I have noticed is that the patient may start having that symptom, and if you notice that your fluid also starts coming out after in the next one or two. So it's, they, they do get symptoms as the lung is getting expanded. And the one guy who had obsess, you know, a large amount of effusion, I think he became symptomatic because of the sudden relief of that increased pressure. He had a mediastinal shift. That mediastinal shift, I think, got, you know, when it reversed or became normal, that, I think, made him feel something. And then we stopped because we thought we caused the pneumo, but it wasn't the pneumo. And the times where I have ignored that, when I have gone and I've, you know, done it, patient has had a pneumothorax. <laughs> so pay attention to patient symptoms is the bottom line. All right, so, um, so how do you, uh, when you finally get the results, how do you approach, um, uh, come to a diagnosis? So look at the appearance of the fluid. Like I said, if it's bloody, look at, uh, get a hematocrit. It's significant only if it's greater than 1%. And in these cases, the cause usually is either malignancy, tumor, or trauma. If it is less than 1%, then again, it's because you, know, you had either got a traumatic tap or it's not significant. Appearance of the pleural fluid, again, if it's cloudy, centrifuge the specimen and then look at uh, what lies above. If that's clear, um, then it's because of protein and cells. If it remains cloudy, then it's either a chylothorax or a pseudochylothorax. And in that case, look at the sediment. If you have cholesterol crystals, then it's a pseudochylothorax. If there is no cholesterol crystals, um, then you, should, you can then send in for the pleural fluid triglycerides but at the, you know, we tend to send everything all together. And uh, what we have seen is that if the pleural fluid triglyceride level is less than 50, then it is a pseudochylothorax. If it's more than 110, then it's a chylothorax. And if it is in between, then in those cases, you can ask the lab to look for chylomicrons. But I was just told that they used to do a send out test. Now they don't do it anymore. So tough luck. You just have to decide clinically what this could be if it is between 50 to 110. So the significance of the high dose, uh, the high dose, and so yes, and I'll come to that in the chylothorax and the pseudochylothorax. So my understanding was that there should be no cholesterol, but sometimes there are two processes that are taking place, and up to 60 of cholesterol can be seen even in a chylothorax. So the one patient that we uh, just had, who had a chylothorax had um, cholesterol of about 50 to 60. So technically, and then the cause we will, and I'll come to that case if I have time. So anyway, if there were no chylomicrons present, then it's a pseudochylothorax. If you see chylomicrons, then it's a chylothorax. So that's how you would differentiate that. And the point being that uh, for a chyliform or a chylothorax, it's not necessary for the fluid to look chyliform. The fluid has been, um, can be even bloody or it can even look normal colored in even though it turns out to be a chylothorax. And the reason is it depends on when you are tapping the patient. Uh, if the patient has been fasting for whatever reason or has not been eating, they will not have high triglycerides in that fluid. So you could have a 50 to 110 and it could still be a chylothorax because of the fact that the patient was not on a high fat diet for whatever reason. Then, um, so again, if it is, um, we talked about looking at uh, cell count, and if the cell count uh, is predominantly neutrophilic, um, also we'll come to the cell differential. So when you look at the cell count, uh, cell differential, if it's predominantly neutrophilic, then you look to see whether or not patient has infiltrates on the chest X-ray. Um, if there are infiltrates present and the patient has uh, you know, positive sputum, fever, and so on, so then you know that it's a paranormonic effusion. If there are infiltrates, but they don't have any of the other symptoms, then, where my, uh, I, my ordering is all lost. But if there is infiltrates, but no sputum, then uh, you should think about whether this could be a PE, because what you're seeing on the X-ray uh, could be an infarcted lung. So if there are no infiltrates, and yet the fluid is predominantly neutrophilic, uh, in those cases, look at the abdominal CT because uh, gastrointestinal disease, such as, such as Emily, yeah. yes, liver abscess, pancreatitis, subdiaphragmatic abscesses, 
So those kind of things, uh, and it's not uncommon because you could get a patient with uh, post-hernia surgery who gets, uh, you know, uh, pleural effusion, and then if it turns out to be predominantly um, EMNs, then it's related to that. Maybe there was an abscess there. Uh, again, if there is no infiltrates and there is no GI disease, then again, think about PE. So that's why we go to um, the um, a CT angio to look for a PE. If it's predominantly lymphocytic, then it suggests that this is a chronic pleural process. Uh, you can check an ADA to see whether or not if it's positive or high. Uh, you can consider tuberculosis to be one of the diagnoses. If it is negative, um, then again, you're going to get a CT, and uh, maybe a PE may not be a PE. Um, if it's not a PE and the patient is improving, then um, again, um, nothing to do, just watch. If the patient is not improving and is symptomatic, then you probably have to do uh, more invasive procedures such as pleural biopsies. Um, obviously, the one step that I missed here is that, you know, you would send it for cytology and look for cytology. Cytology comes back positive for malignancy, then um, obviously, that's the cause for the predominantly lymphocytic effusion. Causes for a lymphocytic effusion, which was, again, um, uh, would be drug reactions, Dressler's, connective tissue disease, asbestos, and parasitic diseases. Bilateral pleural effusions are often transudative but can be seen in uh, exudative effusions, such as those due to collagen vascular disease. Uh, sometimes you do have bilateral PEs, and it can give rise to an effusion. Malignancy, again, if it's metastatic, might also give rise to bilateral effusion. But predominantly, it's CHF and collagen vascular disease. Transudative effusions causes are congestive heart failure, uh, hepatic hydrothorax. Usually, 70% of the cases occur on the right. Um, about 25% of the cases occur on the left and can occasionally be bilateral. Again, the cause for that is because of defects in the diaphragm that's responsible for it. So that's the reason you get this basically peritoneal fluid that's tracking up into the negative, uh, because of the negative pressure in the pleural space upwards into the pleural space. Nephrotic syndrome, again, the mechanism is decreased oncotic pressure, increased hydrostatic pressure. Um, that may be the cause. Peritoneal dialysis is the other. Uh, and in these cases, if you stop the PD, um, uh, then you'll find that the effusion goes down. Didn't we have a patient like that in the unit? Just um, uh, someone. There was a question of it, yeah. We passed yeah, him. The one. Um, and what they can do when I was talking to Leahy is they can actually, I think they can do like some kind of dye or something. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then they injected that into yeah. the, with the peritoneal. They didn't, I mean, but it didn't, didn't go up, yeah. Radio label that you mean? Yeah, yeah. That or, yeah, there was a dye study too. I know, I remember and the patient. She eventually died. She's the one who had like all kinds. That's right. I remember her now. Fontan procedure, which is I forget what it was, but it's some kind of um, rerouting. Right, yeah. Pulmonary, 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 pulmonary venal occlusive disease is another cause of transudative effusion. Uh, obstruction of the brachiocephalic or SVC, again, as a result of increased hydrostatic pressure that prevents lymphatic drainage and thereby causes the effusion. Again, urinothorax, which will be a transudative effusion with a low pH, and will come as a question. Causes would be urinary obstruction, trauma, malignancy, post kidney biopsy, or if it's a failed nephrostomy tube that, um, uh, you know. What's the measure of creatinine for urinothorax? Urine creatinine, and what's the creatinine? It's in the pH. pH will be, uh, you know, the urine pH is, unless, of course, they have that, what is that? bacteria that's there which causes the high pH and therefore then you have proteus or something, proteus UTI, only then I guess is the pH. But most of the times what is the urine pH that you send? It's always like 6 or 5.5 and so on. So transudative effusions usually should have the pH should be equivalent to uh, serum or plasma. Occasionally PE can also present as a transudative effusion. <coughs> Sarcoidosis, again, due to lymphatic obstruction, can give rise to. Malignant effusion um, mechanism can be either as a direct result because of uh, pleural metastases, obstruction of lymphatics, mediastinal lymph node involvement, thoracic duct interruption, uh, and bronchial obstruction. So in this case, it's more like a trap, you know, when the lung doesn't expand, 
uh, or that lobe doesn't expand, so that uh, eventually, just like post pneumonectomies, you know, eventually that space gets filled up with fluid. So similarly, this would happen. Pericardial involvement, again, if there is pericardial mets, again, that irritates the pleura and that can cause a malignant effusion. Indirectly, can be caused by hypoproteinemia, post obstructive pneumonitis, so it becomes like a paranemonic effusion actually. It's not, you know, there's no malignancy in the pleural space itself. Uh, patients can have a PE as a result of malignancy, and that can give rise to the effusion. Post-radiation therapy, they can be uh, pleural effusion. Uh, most common cause is obviously lung, uh, followed by breast cancer, lymphoma, GI, such as colon cancer, genitourinary, and then sometimes it's an unknown primary. And like I said, most often the cause is an adenocele, uh, that you'll have positive cytology. Um, well, like I said, some people fall, believe that less than 7.2 for pleurodesis indicators, but others don't. We, I think it's still worthwhile to proceed with pleurodesis um, if needed and not just limit it based on the pH. Glucose less than 60 or a, a decrease in pleural pressure of more than 9.5 was after 500 cc's. Again, reason being that this indicates that it's trapped lung. So if the lung does not re-expand, then uh, the two surfaces will not adhere to each other and consequently there won't be uh, successful pleurodesis. Sclerosing agent, again, that's this month's uh, pro-con as to whether or not talc should be used for pleurodesis or not. Um, as you know, we don't get the European brand here, which is, doesn't have the, uh, the particle size that is associated with ARDS. Uh, so consequently, um, there has, there's about a 1% incidence of ARDS following talc slurry pleurodesis, and therefore um, we don't like, or it's light doesn't like to have talc as being one of the causes. I mean, might cause ARDS and other complications if you can avoid. So other agents that can be given or that we often give is the doxycycline, which is the dose is 500 milligrams. Leomycin, again, we, are, we can't because we are not licensed to give leomycin, so we don't typically use it. We've used just doxy. Other treatment for malignant effusions can be serial thoracentesis. You can do a pleurex catheter, pleuroperitoneal shunt, and symptomatic treatment with um, O2 and narcotics. Effusion following cabbage, very common, and we see this oftentimes. Uh, so the cause is uh, can be just post cabbage as a result of the surgery inflammation, you know, the you know the pericardial inflammation and sim, uh, sympathetic pleural irritation of the left side, and consequently the effusion. The characteristics are that how it dif how it's different from the PCIS or post cardiac. What is that? Uh, um, Injury, cardiac injury syndrome is that PCIS is often associated with fever. There can be chest pain. Uh, it usually occurs six weeks to maybe three months later, um, whereas the early post-bypass effusions can occur as early as 30 days, can last as long as up to a year. And uh, you'll find that this is predominantly lymphocytic, which is interesting because, you know, this is acute inflammation that's causing it. But at the same time, the characteristics are uh, and this was based on um, uh, case series by Light and some others. Stylothorax. So, again, doesn't come out that well, but um, its um, uh, presence is characterized by its chyliform. The, it remains, the fluid is turbid, and it has got a high triglyceride levels. Causes are... Uh, in patients with LAN, so 25% of patients with LAN can have a chylus pleural effusion. Um, otherwise, it can be post-traumatic, so post uh, heart transplant and lung transplant um, as a result of the destruction uh, as they are tearing it and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, the other most common cause is malignancy, most commonly lymphoma. Collagen vascular associated, so the most common uh, collagen vascular diseases associated with pleural effusions are rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. The differences with rheumatoid arthritis, this is rarely the first presentation. So with RA, usually there are other joint manifestations, especially, again, both questions, they will have subcutaneous nodules present. 
So um, that would be the question that, you know, blah, 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 what tests can be done? And you can either send rheumatoid factor, they'll have a low glucose, uh, low pH sometimes, and uh, they may have also have a high ANA titer. Lupus, on the other hand, it can be the presenting feature because it's a serocytis, so there can be, it can be the first presenting symptom uh, for uh, lupus. And it can be bilateral, these are small effusions, and sometimes in case of lupus can also be drug-induced lupus. Paranomonic effusions, this is the classification by the ACCP as to um, which effusions need to be drained. So the classification is based on the size of the effusion and whether it's loculated or not, as well as uh, the presence and absence of bacteria. So your minimal effusion, uh, so A0, so it's less than 10 millimeters on chest X-ray as, as on a decubitus film, and they are uh, BX is where it's culture and gram stain results are not known because obviously you cannot tap this effusion uh, safely, maybe with ultrasound, but again, why would you tap a minimal effusion like this? And uh, so obviously we don't know the culture. So a small effusion, which is A0, this can be seen in early, like, you know, in a community-acquired pneumonia patient. Most of these will resolve with antibiotic therapy alone. Um, on the other hand, if you have a small to moderate effusion, which is free-flowing, so it's not loculated, so it's less, it's more than 10 millimeters, but it's less than half the hemithorax. Uh, and again, when you send it for culture, it's negative culture, negative gram stain, and on chemistry, it's got a pH that's greater than 7.2. Uh, so the risk of poor outcome is low. So you can try doing serial uh, thoracentesis and removing the fluid or trying and seeing how much of this can improve with antibiotics. So you don't need drainage. The times that you need drainage are when you have, when it becomes a loculated effusion. Where is my, no, no, somewhere here. Okay. When it, if it's a loculated effusion or um, if there is either positive culture or positive gram stain, or if you have pH that's less than 7.2, or like I said earlier, if there is um, evidence that your LDH is going up. So if somebody is on antibiotics and you're doing serial thoracentesis and you find that the LDH is actually coming down, then that indicates that maybe you can proceed without putting in any um, chest tubes or catheters. And of course, if it looks like pus, obviously it needs to be drained because antibiotics don't penetrate into abscesses. And so the single most predictive for poor outcome or the indication for drainage is uh, pH. That's why, you know, previously and in other classifications, especially if you read Light's chapter on paranormonic effusion, we will put in LDH greater than 1,000, sodium uh, or glucose less than 40, as all being poor predictors, but the most important predictor is the pH. And that's why it's important to collect it and send it properly. That we have to drain if your pH. I mean, chances are that if it's that low, your pH is going to be low, unless you put in an air bubble or didn't collect it properly. What is the uh, need for need for uh, chest tube? Oh, chest. That's it. Meaning it won't heal by it won't go away just by antibiotics alone. Conservative management. So pleural effusions associated with PE is because of increased capillary permeability distal to the embolus, uh, which is related to um, the ischemia caused by the clot. Uh, RBC doesn't necessarily have to be bloody. So in about a third of the patients, the RBC count is less than 10,000. It is between 10 to 100,000 in uh, about 50%. And in about 20% of cases, it can be more than 100,000. So that is the uh, hematocrit that's more than 1%. There are three presentation groups. Um, so you find that those who come in with, uh, so if you have a pleural effusion and the patient has a pleuritic chest pain but does not have any fever or does not have anything to suggest a pneumonia, it can be very well due to a PE. So that's considered. And shortness of breath with pleuritic chest pain in the absence of fever and other signs of infection, uh, chances are that it is PE. Dyspnea alone as the presenting feature of a PE is associated with effusion in about 26%. Uh, and if the patient comes in with hemodynamic collapse, you don't find an effusion in these cases. That was interesting, I thought, as I 
diagnosis. I mean, I, I knew about the pruritic chest pain, but I didn't know about the specific incidence. All right, uh, we don't have time, um, so I won't go through this example. But basically, this is just to go walk you through the, um, uh, you know, the process. So just one case maybe. So this is a patient who um, had a right-sided effusion, as you can see, um, protein by protein itself, even if you took the protein more than 3.5, so that's the modified LIGHTS criteria, and LIGHT himself said that his original criteria was as good as the modified criteria, so you don't necessarily need to go by the modified criteria. So this was uh, an exudate, which was predominantly uh, lymphocytic, but it also had some eosinophils, and it was yellow. Uh, cytology was negative. Uh, patient had a bronchoscopy, but there was no endobronchial lesion. Uh, and so eventually, I think the patient did okay, so I didn't send him for any further testing. This lady was a smoker, had severe COPD, uh, and uh, she had a, you know, half hemithorax kind of effusion, and I had tapped it uh, twice, and so you can see this is almost a little bit loculated with some atelectasis, and on that you can also see she's got a pericardial effusion for some reason. So again, by protein criteria, it met, uh, it was an exudate, and um, uh, pH was normal, and again, she had, this was the second tap, so she had eosinophils about 28%, so that was again to show that sometimes eosinophilia is either related to a previous traumatic tap and because you never know what, how much blood you spill into the space. Um, so again, I, the first time I didn't send the ADA. Uh, the second time when it came back that the cytology was negative since it was predominantly lymphocytic, I sent the ADA, but the level was not in the range for um, a TB. So then she had a CTPE, which was negative. Uh, she had two cytology specimens that was negative, and uh, I bronched her for any endobronchial lesions. It was, it was negative. And um, eventually she went for VATS and pleural biopsy, which was, again, very nonspecific. Came back as, as acute and chronic inflammation, and um, I, I still don't know the cause. So there are some unexplained pleural effusions. But in this case, I think it was worthwhile going into all of that. So she had a pericardial effusion, and the cardiologist put her on colchicine, and that took care of the pericardial effusion. So I don't know what the insult was that led to both, but it went away. This was a patient who had post-liver um, transplant. He had a, um, a pleural effusion, so the transplant was done in 2006. This was an x-ray from 2009 that he had an effusion in, so there was no intervening x-rays. This doesn't show it, but there was an effusion. Um, it was bloody, it was uh, exudative, it was predominantly lymphocytic, and despite the multiple workups, I stopped without before sending him for a CT-guided biopsy because everything was normal. So our plan was, um, you know, just to follow this and assume that this was maybe, and it is reported that post-transplant, post-liver transplant, there are pleural effusions that can be there. So assuming the same process as a post-cabbage effusion, so I assumed that, and he has done okay. He still has an effusion as of last, last year. This, if you could see, uh, was the patient who had the chylothorax. So this is what a chyliform effusion looks like. So I guess uh, should have taken a better picture. I don't know. So anyway, the findings, he, ha he was tapped twice. And so interestingly, like I said, his, he did have a cholesterol that was 60, uh, but his triglyceride level was 350. Okay. And it was predominantly lymphocytic. Again, it doesn't show, but what he ended up having was B-cell lymphoma that was obstructing. There was a mass that was surrounding the uh, descending thoracic aorta and um, the thoracic duct. I strongly recommend that you buy this book. If there's a new edition coming, write to Light and ask him. But if you haven't bought this book, you need to buy it. It's a very easy reading. You can, you know, every time, and we are doing more and more thoracentesis, so it's worthwhile to keep that as a good reference. It's an excellent book. All right. So, and the first year, since you have the $1,000 grant, book grant, 